And so it actually helped me a lot not to be your standard analyst for this particular account. Um, because not everyone knows. Some people are just hearing from maybe their managers or higher ups, we need this data. There's privacy and security issues as well. So you have to understand laws and data governance. There's never going to be a job that you like 100% of things. So to know what the office goals are helps a lot. Welcome to the another episode of Data Talk with Doers, the podcast where we dwell deep into the world of data and explore the stories of those who are shaping the future of industry. I'm your host Neema and today we have a truly inspiring guest joining us. Our guest today is Clarissa, a seasoned professional with a decade of experience in data field. Clarissa is currently navigating an exciting career transition into revenue operations or the RevOps. Uh, bringing her wealth of knowledge and analytic skills to this emerging space. Despite identifying as an introvert, she has already been making a significant stride on uh, being an active ambassador for Magnet 8 community, where she inspires and supports fellow enthusiasts. So without further ado, let's welcome Clarissa to the show. Um, Thanks a lot for joining the show, Clarissa. How are you doing? Good. Thank you for having me. It's always good to see you. <laughs> yeah, it, it's nice to have you here as well. So uh, let's get started with uh, getting to know you. Could you share your background details? Sure. So I graduated um, actually in public relations <laughs> with a minor in theater. Um, oh. So as you can imagine, not anything to do with analytics. <laughs> and from there, I um, did ad- advertising sales. Okay. And I fell into digital marketing media, so I did a lot of email marketing, programmatic media buying, um, account management, um, and then I fell into business intelligence. Yeah. So, um, so what initially drew you into the field of business intelligence? And because you don't have the conventional or the traditional courses that you have taken, like computer science or stuff, so what uh, pushed you into uh, the data analysis and business intelligence field? So I didn't find it, it found me. (laughs) So I was an ad ops professional when there was an opening at my company to be a metrics analyst for a big account. Mm -hmm. And there's three people that sort of put my name out there because I was really good at Excel. So I did a lot of um, formulas and I knew how to do a lot of different things in Excel, I guess, than your average ad ops person. And so they asked me if I was interested, and I didn't know any better. (laughs) So I I said yes, and then when I found out what it was, it was quite a learning curve. I I didn't sleep for, I I think, a week trying to figure things out. Um, But then afterwards, I would say, like, three months, I really got a hang of it. And then after six months, I felt like, a pro like I had a lot of different skills that I can add to table where a lot of people were more experienced than I was but I had a lot of curiosity and I had a lot of background in account management which was helpful because the reports that I was creating were for account teams and people not in data so I knew how to present data in a way that was feasible to them And so it actually helped me a lot not to be your standard analyst for this particular account. So uh, during your tenure, like you have been in the field for quite a long. So what are some of the most common challenges uh, that you have faced while working as a business intelligence analyst? And how have you overcome that? Yeah, so it's working with stakeholders. So you have a variety of stakeholders. Obviously, a lot of them... Some of them are really good with data and they understand numbers and they understand the the business of why asking certain questions. And so those type of people make your life a lot easier um, because the the goals are very clear. Um, The problem is you're not working with only those people. And so sometimes people are coming to you with questions and they themselves are not clear of what the end goal is. (laughs) And so... A lot of my job is sort of like playing like, let's figure this out. (laughs) And so it's asking questions. I think you can't be a data analyst without asking good questions and really getting down to what the issues are, what the problems are, what they're trying to solve. Um, Because not everyone knows. Some people are 
just hearing from maybe their managers or higher ups, we need this data or I need to know this and they'll ask you for everything under the moon. <laughs> and you have to sort of wheel them back and be like, you know, just out of curiosity, where are you going with this? <laughs> What's the goal? Like what, what was asked from you? Why, why were they asking? What happened before this that they asked you this? So you can sort of get details and you figure out, oh, okay, this is why they're asking this. And so sometimes you really have to educate your stakeholders. Mm -hmm. um, so that's very important is, is to be able to ask good questions. Right. And that to me is probably the biggest challenge is because if you're starting off, mm -hmm. you yourself have a lot of questions and you don't know what to ask at first. But mm -hmm. after a while, you start seeing a pattern and you start right. to know, okay, I'm gonna start with ABC is the most natural line of questioning. <laughs> <laughs> and it gets it gets easier from there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I uh, like how you mentioned noticing the patterns because mm -hmm. uh, as an, like everybody starts in with being an entry, entry level data analyst and you don't know what you do until you get familiar with the things, right? So exactly. um, I, I totally understand um, the challenges and so, uh, um, uh, in your experience or in your opinion, how has the role of uh, BI intelligence analyst evolved over the past few years? Yeah, I, I do find stakeholders are a lot savvier and there's a lot of information out there and they're very curious. Mm -hmm. um, so they have educated themselves. Um, it's not everyone, but definitely a great amount. The other thing is just the, the speed of technology. It, when I started, Excel was was the tool <laughs> and we have a lot of other tools now right. um also i think too is um with ai and machine learning there's mm -hmm. even more tools and a lot of move into um like analytics engineering and data engineering mm -hmm. yep. and the sort of the need for data analysts to also know pipeline even though there might be a data engineering team um I feel like there's still a need for yeah. um, data analysts to know this part as well. So I think long are the days where you can just work in Excel. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be comfortable with like coding. You have to be comfortable with understanding process. There's privacy and security issues as well. So you have to understand laws and data governance. Mm. So there's a lot of different aspects besides your regular you know business and numbers i think something that you have uh, tried to explain is the data governance which is very important and myself being a bi analyst right now i see that being discussed quite often in a lot of meetings in in different organization and on linkedin as well so um, uh, i appreciate your thoughts on this uh, clarissa and um, as you're transitioning out of your uh, th this data space, right, what are some mm -hmm. of the key lessons or skills you're taking with you? Yeah, just understanding logic, um, the sort of process of how I come to problem solve as an analyst wow. helps a lot into revenue operations. And data's everywhere. So before I even became a business intelligence analyst or a metric analyst, I was using data for example, for program, programmatic media buying um, to see, you know, what sites were performing the best. Um, so data is used in any and every field and with revenue operations is no different. Mm -hmm. um, so it's all is knowing a, a lot about like the deals, the sales, understanding um, like the churn and where things go off and where you can do them better. So all those things use require data and also require to have good data. So knowing that how people enter data, for example, in Salesforce <laughs> mm -hmm. to make sure everything is, is aligned in a certain way. So all those things, now that I seen the, the back end, the analyst side of when people just enter data randomly and you have like one word <laughs> can be typed in seven different ways and how much work it is for me to clean that. You know, I'm more careful now when I write things down into a database. So um, for me, that's something I can I can share at Revenue Operations is sort of translating that to the sales team, um, but also being mindful of the amount of work it takes mm. to do certain things and keeping that in mind. How do I make this easy 
and how do I make this um, repeatable with with a lot with less human error? So before going into your uh, your pa- the career that you are looking for, how did you identify your next career path you are passionate about? Yeah, so I wrote down a list of things I've already done, things that I enjoy doing at my job or previous jobs. And I also started just taking different courses online, especially free. Don't want to spend a lot of money in discovery until I know for sure it's what I want to do. Um, So for me, HubSpot had a a free um, revenue operations um, certificate. So, and it was short, so it didn't take a lot of time investment either. So for me, it was doing that and seeking out projects. Um, so I'm doing a project now. It's a project management role, and it has it's not necessarily revenue operations, but it's important to understand in project management for operations. And so in doing this project, I'm learning a lot about the different skills needed, and I'm assessing do I what aspects of this do I like. Um, so that I know if I'm choosing the right path. And so for me, that's important because you can always guess if you're going to like something, but you won't know until you do it or you learn about it. Because I did learn a variety of other things like UX design. And I learned I don't have enough patience for, (laughs) for the feedback and redesigning, but it was interesting course. So again, you don't know that until you actually start learning about these things, start putting into practice and being like, oh, this is this is not going to work out long term. <laughs> Thanks. So uh, it's, it's not interesting to know how you found your passion. And I think this question will help uh, all of uh, all, all of us who are trying to find out passion because um, like data field is like kind of exciting and stuff and people randomly they go into the field um, mm-hmm. but it may not be the most passion they, they may it not may not be the right one too so uh, the, I, I like the steps that you have taken and and you have shared to us as well and, and I hope this helps every one of us to find out what our passion is and uh, could you so, also list out so you you told me that you uh, had taken a couple of steps to find what your passion is but what mm-hmm. are the different steps that you're taking right now to prepare for your career uh, direction that change? Yeah, so I reach out to people on LinkedIn. So I reach out to certain roles or certain companies mm-hmm. and I just ask for a coffee chat and I just ask them what their day is like and what do they like about it, what they don't like about it. And that's very important because there's never going to be a job that you like 100% of things. So to know what the obstacles are helps a lot. So for example, when I talked to some dating engineering folks, as I thought, well, okay, I do like data, but maybe I can do data engineering or analytics engineering. Mm -hmm. And I realized some of their obstacles seems overwhelming to me already. (laughs) (laughs) And then when I talked to revenue operations, you know, they also have obstacles and can be overwhelming. But I was familiar because so, when I graduated, my first three years was in sales. I did advertising sales. So it was something that I've done before. I I know the kind of obstacles in, in sales in the different departments. And so I know what that overwhelm feels like and I'm actually was very comfortable with that. Versus in data, when I get overwhelmed with certain technical aspects, um, I find I can't troubleshoot as well as those other roles Mm. and I find myself always seeking help and and then things like that and so for me it was sort of like what do I feel I actually have strength and that can grow and I become an expert Mm. and you don't know that until you talk to people and you ask them how they got there and what their obstacles and and you really learn what you like and, and what you don't like from from talking to people that are doing it versus the courses so the courses can help you see if you're interested and what things may come but just talking to people, you realize, well, certain things don't get used. You actually do this instead. And it's the same for data analysts, by the way. Mm-hmm. Data analytics is so vast. It's, I would say, to instead narrow down the companies you want to work for or the fields you want to work for and ask people in that particular field because it's going to look and, different. And- and so when after you talk to uh, different people like say coffee chat 
uh, how do you then ask for a role like are you trying to transition with your within your company or do you get a referral or what does the next step look like yeah so i've been trying to transition within my own company um so i really haven't asked for referrals um to but honestly that takes time there are people that i have talked multiple times now in coffee chats where mm -hmm. you know maybe i could feel comfortable but honestly i think linkedin is best for gathering information if people don't know you it's very uncomfortable to refer someone to a company because that's their reputation on the line okay. now after I talk to someone for a while, they see when I post, they see what I've learned, then they can feel comfortable. It's like, oh, this person has been dedicated for every single, every single time I see them, they write about this and they're learning this and they're very dedicated. They could feel like a referral is absolutely something they can do, but um, I, I wouldn't go there just for referrals. It just doesn't feel right. It's really about um, making connections. Mm -hmm. um, so that for me is probably probably the best way to use LinkedIn. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, with I always find it's easier to move in in the company that you have because there's so many people that can already vouch for you. Because um, they can ask around, who's this person? They reach out to me. And you know, if you have a good reputation, that can be great. If not, <laughs> maybe it's not so great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Clarissa, for that advice uh, and 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 the clarity of steps that you have provided. I, I, I would so, like to also know what are the misconception on, on about working in data that you have encountered, and I think it will will help a lot of folks who are trying to enter data without prior knowledge. Sure, I think there's a lot of focus on tools. Like a lot of people are talking about Python and that kind of stuff, and. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, it, it can be. Again, that's why it's important to reach out to people on LinkedIn and the companies that you want to work for or the fields that you want to work for so you can really see if these tools are being used mm -hmm. um, because there's a lot of time wasted that perhaps are not necessary. Like, I've never used Python. Um, I don't really use SQL and things like that. Um, but in other companies, that's 100% what they do a lot of the time. Okay. Um, I also think it is important just to learn new tools just to see if we can make things more efficient but a lot of companies will have their own set of tools and systems um, that works for them you know based on their budget and their process mm -hmm. and the type of you know labor capital that they have in place um, so I think it's important to to look to ask and look at those things because I notice a lot of people will say the same thing. They spend so much time learning this thing and then they go to the company and it's never used or is used very little. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. That's true. Cool. Uh, so um, you have al always shared on LinkedIn um, saying that you are an introvert, uh, but you are also an ambassador, an active ambassador for a community called Magnet. And I've been uh, seeing you uh, um, encouraging people, uh, enthusiasts uh, on, on their mission uh, or finding themselves or the projects that they're working on. So how did how did you feel of being an active ambassador? Because that takes that's that's not a job of an introvert, basically. So you will have to talk to different people. You'll have to be more enthusiastic and energetic so what what yeah. made you do that role or what were you trying to achieve out of it so for me as an introvert I really like helping people so it's very natural thing for me and so when I find something I like that social anxiety part or the having to interact with people kind of goes away mm -hmm. the other part is the majority of the community was online and so it was a lot of like typing messages. So I'm not interacting mm -hmm. as much in person or on Zoom. Right. And our Zoom calls were maybe once a week or something like that. So it was great for me as an introvert because if I had to do in person all the time, the, the energy in the room would overwhelm me. I would need to recover. Mm -hmm. But because a lot of it was just, you know, texting and the board or messaging people, I would have um, coffee chats with a lot of people too. Um, but I wouldn't, wouldn't schedule more than one or two a week. So I sort of kept my boundaries of what I knew I was capable of. Mm -hmm. So I felt it was actually great for an introvert. The, the other thing too is, um, I do have a theater background, so I know how to turn it on. <laughs> 
I don't have to go and hide if I want to, you know, go to a vent and just do something real quick and just be, you know, yeah. within myself. <laughs> but I also know how to turn it on when I have to. Like you said, I'm an ambassador, so I have to present Magnet 8 with, like, the best light possible. So I, I want to make sure people feel, like, welcomed and that they're wanted here and that I'm curious about helping their journey. And so, yeah, I definitely use my theater background to turn it on gather that extrovert energy <laughs> that's nice um, so the fi uh, final question on a uh, general interview is that um, so y could you give share some so, some advices or uh, tips on someone who's trying to get into bi field and if and to find that whether it's really uh, right for them before fully committing into the field yeah, I say um, it's a great time to join. There are a lot of projects now, like on LinkedIn or challenges, and a lot of them are free. So I think the best way is to get hands-on experience, to be honest. Like, there's certain things that you can just Google online. You don't have to do, like, courses right away. You can if you want. Um, it can be a kind of boring, to be honest. <laughs> I'm just being honest. But I think projects are different because there's high stakes, you understand what's going on usually, you get a really good understanding what the project is and what your goal is, and you get to build something. And usually in challenges, there's a community, so you could ask for help, and I think that's the best way because you're getting hands-on experience on a project, and you get to have a community. And some challenges, not all of them, will give you feedback so which is really important too, so that you can get better. And for me, I think if I were to start it in the way where I wanted to be a data analyst, right, it found me. But if I were to go back and I'm like, oh, I want to be a data analyst, I think that's one of the things I would do is join the challenge. Nice, nice. Um, so that's the end of the normal interview question. So uh, we also have a, a rapid fire session uh, okay. along with the season. <laughs> So okay. the first question is, what's your favorite data visualization tool? I've only used Tableau, uh, but I played with Power BI a little bit, and I think DAX is pretty cool, so I don't know. But Tableau, yeah, I guess, for now. <laughs> you, you have me that on, on that because I am also a Tableau girl. Are you really? Okay. <laughs> yeah. And um, I already know this about you, but just for the audience, um, coffee or tea? Oh, tea. Tea, hands down. I'm obsessed. I almost started a company during the pandemic about tea because I'm that obsessed. Oh. And green tea is my favorite, but also hibiscus. So I like a lot of fruit teas. It helps with my sugar cravings. Oh, so. nice, nice, nice. Tea. Yeah. Uh, so uh, which do you prefer, books or podcasts? Podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have ADHD. So I'm almost illiterate. It's very hard for me to focus on a book. Oh. So a lot of times I'll do audiobooks. Uh -huh. um, but sometimes those audiobooks can be a lot. Because some of them could be 8 hours or 12 hours long. Mm -hmm. And with podcasts, they're usually shorter. And it's usually a conversation. Yeah. So as someone with ADHD, it works 10 times better. Oh, okay. So can you share a recent podcast that you're listening to? I'm trying to think, not anything with data, but I do like like um, Lex Friedman. I think he's very cute. <laughs> and he has amazing guests. I mean, his, his quality of guests are amazing, and there's a variety. Nice. And so for me, I love listening to his podcast. Oh, okay, nice. So uh, one, uh, what's the one piece of tech that you can't live with? I think Google Sheets and Excel. I know like a lot of people... <laughs> don't like those but it it works it's fast sometimes yeah. unless you're working with a lot of data like honestly yeah google sheets excel yeah i i, I love it i'm i i also use excel for ran anything random i write things on excel do a certain um some division stuff it, it's easy on excel exactly. it's easy it's fast yeah <laughs> it's fast yeah yeah so a last question is, um, if you could have a dinner with any of your favorite data analyst or data scientist, who would it be? Okay, so I know Lex Freeman is not a data scientist, but I'm just, hear me out. He does AI machine learning. I'm just saying, he's a research scientist, right? Yeah. So 
<laughs> you can yeah i'm sorry i have to go with lex freeman i'm just a big fan girl great <laughs> nice uh, so i think we understood who we are uh, who, who we are fan of and yeah. uh, so that's that's all uh, for the uh, interview clarissa i think we learned a lot about how you how we have to understand what the passion of a career i mean our passion is in terms of career and also um how we could successfully transition uh, into the career so uh, i I'm, i'm sure your tips and advices are very helpful and uh, what are your final thoughts or any advices to uh, the general audience who are looking in switching into data or going out of data or going out of data okay so if you're going into data projects 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 mm-hmm. if you're worried about taking a course or how much money just go ahead and start the project um especially the ones that or an excel or tableau but it's minimal stuff um just go ahead and do that honestly i think it's a, you're going to get a much better feel than courses because a lot of courses are best case scenarios or trying to trying to prepare you for the worst and a lot of companies they don't even have the resources for the worst <laughs> or the money for all those tools so it's just not necessary when you're starting out And then if you're going out of the field, I think it's just writing down what you currently like about your job. Um if you work at a company where there's a lot of different departments, is talking to those people and see um if you can shadow them or if you can work on a project with them just for you to get a feel before you commit to either exploring more knowledge, getting certifications, cuz all of those things even if they're free, they take time. And so for me I always go for the experience first. So whatever you can do to get hands-on experience before you even do education. I'm doing project management and I have never taken a class. <laughs> I'm learning and screwing up as I go and it's beautiful. <laughs> Well thank you thanks a lot Clarissa that's that uh, quite helpful for a lot of us um and it was a pleasure having you on the show uh, as a third guest for season 2 so thanks oh, a lot <laughs> yeah i'm honored and it's always great talking to you thank